South Korea. You know, Buffett is not exactly what you might expect. This jet setter shows up on the tarmac in a simple sweatsuit, but don't let his casual look fool you. Buffett is all business. Charming, yes, but all business. And right now he has a plan for conquering Asia. On this trip, he heads from Omaha to China to South Korea and back, all in under 56 hours, and we are with him every step of the way. At 77 years old, Warren Buffett is working as hard as ever, circling the globe to see firsthand the progress his companies have made and to rally his troops. The chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway since 1964, Buffett sits over an enviable cornucopia of household names, including Dairy Queen, Geico, NetJets, Seas Candies, and Fruit of the Loom. He also owns major stakes in American icons, including Coca-Cola and the Washington Post. It all began over 65 years ago. The legendary investor buys his first stock, City Services Preferred, at age 11. He liquidates his entire portfolio of three shares just three years later. And I bought it at 38 and sold it at 40, and it went to 200. <laughs> that made you think <laughs> that, I should. That maybe patience was a good, a better thing. <laughs> As Buffett watches the gains he missed out on, he learns that investing is much like his favorite sport, baseball. Ted Williams. And the science of hitting talks about waiting for the right pitch. And that's what investing is. I mean, there are a lot of parallels. Uh, if you swing at bad pitches and feel you have to swing at every pitch, uh, you're going to have a terrible batting average. But if you wait for the right pitch, in baseball, once you get two strikes on you, you have to swing at a bad pitch if it's in the, in the uh, strike zone. In investing, you just wait till you get the right pitch. A skill that this investor, who claims he was destined for a career in asset allocation, has certainly mastered. I tap dance to the office every morning, and the reason I'm tap dancing is because uh, something may happen like that. I may get a phone call, there may be a letter there, and, and when it does, uh, it's a lot of fun. In 1956, at just 25 years old, Buffett starts a limited partnership. The seed money, $100 of his own cash, and investments from family and friends totaling just over $100,000. In less than a decade, Buffett grows that sum to a whopping $26 million, investing in farm equipment manufacturers and textile companies, including one called Berkshire Hathaway. By 1969, Buffett amasses a controlling stake in Berkshire. In the four decades since, he has built it into one of the largest holding companies in the world. The world's third richest man, with a net worth of over $52 billion, is a person of simple pleasures. He has no entourage, no cell phone or Blackberry. In fact, he rarely emails anyone. And he lives in the same home he bought almost 50 years ago in Omaha, Nebraska. Hi. Hi. Buffett makes his deals much the same way he manages his life. He buys what he understands. We're looking for companies with durable competitive advantage, run by able and honest people. And we're looking for uh, businesses that we can acquire at a price that makes sense for Berkshire Hathaway. That's why Berkshire Hathaway has always owned only American companies. Those Buffett could get both his hands and his head around. Ain't she kind of sweet? That is, until May of 2006. That's when Buffett surprises shareholders at his annual meeting with news that he is shifting gears, plunking down $4 billion to buy a controlling stake in Iskar, a metalworking company based in Israel. It's a total change in direction for Buffett, and one that starts with a simple letter. I got a letter in October of 2005 from a man I didn't know about a company I had never heard of, and it was a page and a quarter long, and it just jumped off the page that these were the kind of people I'd want to be associated with in the kind of company. So he said he would come over uh, if I was interested, page and a quarter. I emailed him, and he and two of the associates uh, we're over a little while later, and we just hit it off like that, and I gave him a check for $4 billion without ever seeing the plan. For 80 percent? 80 percent, right. How do you write a, a page and a quarter letter that jumps off the page and grabs well, your attention? It, 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 that doesn't happen very often, but uh, I, could, I could tell the kind of person that, that uh, was on the other end, and I could tell uh, from a few figures and a little description of the business that it was exactly our kind of business. and. Uh, it's a gem. I mean, I, I, I've never, I've never be bought a manufacturing operation that looks as good as this one. But his first look at Iskar's operation doesn't come until after he closes on the deal. Berkshire actually bought Iskar, which was founded by Stefan Wertheimer, sight unseen. 
But since then, the billionaire next door has gained plenty of frequent flyer miles touring his new operations. Buffett visits Iskar's headquarters in Tefan, Israel, which is home to about a third of Iskar's more than 6,000 employees, shortly after buying the cutting tool business. He and longtime friend, Berkshire's vice chairman Charlie Munger, toured the plant in September of 2006. CNBC's Carl Quintanilla is there. I knew where it was when we, when we bought it. <laughs> it. What you have here is a remarkable group of people doing remarkable things in their field, achieving terrific results all over the world, but based right here at eight miles from the Lebanese border. It, it, does that mean the risk premium in Israel is no greater than it is in the U.S.? I would say that there's, in terms of any very short period of time, you could have, you could have an event break out. But over the long term, the United States and Israel have exactly the same risk. I mean, we, we live in a dangerous world. It's our job to make it less dangerous. The trip leaves a lasting impression on Buffett. We'll never find another one like Iskar, but we can just find something that's 80% of Iskar will be very happy. Now, on this trip, he'll get a chance to see Iskar's Asian operations up close. And Asia is key to the company's growth. We're opening a plant in, in, uh, in Dalian uh, for Iskar, and uh, it, it's an important uh, business operation for us. So. Why? Uh, well, Iskar is in 61 countries around the world, based in Israel, uh, but China China will probably be the largest market uh, uh, eventually for Iskar. We, we make all kinds of little carbide cutting tools, and, and it find, they, they find their way throughout industry. So as, as Chinese industries boom, uh, steel industry, the car industry, whatever, they use these little tools. And, and the interesting thing about it is carbide comes from tungsten. Tungsten, by and large, is mined in China. But here was a company in Israel, halfway across the world, and they figured out the best way to use this tungsten and carbide tools. And although they've been selling in China before, this was the first time they've had a plant back there. So the, the technology, the raw material originally went from China to Israel, and now the technology is going from, from Israel to China. And China, you expect, will be the biggest market for, for East Car by what year? By 10 I, years I, from now? I, oh, I would think, I would, I would be surprised if within less than 10 years, China could be the largest market. And already, Iskar's newest factory is setting records. Fresh off a tour of the facility, Buffett says things here in China seem to happen on double time. The factory went up in six months at 250,000 square feet or so, and in six months it was, it was done. And now they're good, <laughs> but they couldn't have done it anyplace else in the world, I don't think, like they did it here in China. Why can you do it in China? Uh, you'd have to ask the people at Iskar, but they, it, it just, there were no roadblocks of any kind whatsoever, they, and, and people worked hard, they got it done fast, and the customers want the product, and we're going to be supplying it to them. What kind of potential does this place have? Well, this place has just that plant right now in its present size will have several hundred million dollars of potential, but we've got room to expand, our customers will be expanding. Uh, I think you will be amazed at what happens. Right now, this is the first factory for, for, for Iskar in China. In China. In China. How, how big is this market going to be down the road? <laughs> it, it will be huge, Becky. I don't know how big it you know, will be, but you have all of these companies that use our type of product cutting tools. And, and uh, you know, we'd be crazy not to be here. Even though Buffett's first international investment wasn't until 2006, he says he's been thinking globally his entire life learning the lessons of globalization early on, starting with his investment company's namesake, the Berkshire Hathaway Textile Mills. There In the go. early, a century plus ago, if you lived in New England, you measured your wealth by looms and, 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 uh, and bobbins, just like people in the Midwest measured their wealth by acres of land. And, and it just it turned to dust, basically. Is it, uh, you think it's continuing to do that in other industries today? Or? It's all, the world's always evolving, you know. I mean, the job of, a, of somebody that allocates capital is to look out and see, not so much, in my case at least, uh, where the world is going, but to make very sure that you know where the, what the world's leaving. Uh, we like what we call durable competitive advantage. That company did not have, it had great workers, it had, perfectly sound equipment. It was making something essential, men's linings and uh, cloth for handkerchiefs and that sort of thing. But 
it did not have any durable competitive advantage, and, and eventually it disappeared. What industries today do you think are, are, are disappearing in that way? Like well, you have to think about any industry that has a high labor cost, because we are at a competitive disadvantage in the United States with industries with high labor costs. So if now there, could, there, there are plenty of exceptions. I mean, the, you're not going to print uh, the Wall Street Journal from China or India or something of the sort. But if you've got a business with a high labor content that's turning out kind of a basic product, uh, you have to think twice about what's going to happen to it. I was wrong in shoes. I went into the domestic shoe business. I was dead wrong because it has moved. Uh, I've been in the textile business. Uh, we're buying our furniture over there. Now we retail it, we don't manufacture, but a domestic manufacturer has a terrible time now compared to 10 years ago. There's a lot of labor there and, the, and, and they're good. In China now, they're losing some of their factories. They're going off offshore to Vietnam yep. because it's cheaper labor there. That's capitalism. So <laughs> I mean, it's even, constantly. even in a communist country, that's capitalism. I mean, the, the world will seek low cost production as long as the quality is thought to be fine. And, and we want to be very careful if we're looking at a business, if it's got a 40% labor content, why is it here and what will keep it here? Because it, it won't be because we know something they don't know. I mean, they, you know, or something, they, I mean the internet and all kinds of things. They've, the, the world has gone uh, flat in that respect. And, and uh, so if you're looking for durable competitive advantage, I mean, you're always looking for the chinks in the armor, the, something that can cause, cause uh, a business that's good today not be good 10 or 20 years ago uh, from now. And you know, that's a prime example. That was a wonderful business. That business, back right after World War II, was making you know, as much money as almost any pharmaceutical company you can name or anything. I mean, it was, it was big, but no more. Coming up, whose idea is this anyway? The man who convinced Warren Buffett to leave Omaha on a whirlwind tour of the Far East. And why the world's greatest investor is certain his secrets to success won't get lost in translation. And later, that's right, throws right, makes a fortune. This fan of Warren Buffett wears a different kind of pinstripes from your average investor. And we've got him. It's an event worthy of fireworks and elaborate celebrations. Yes, there's a new factory opening here in Dalian, China, less than 300 miles east of Beijing. But the real cause for celebration, a guest of honor. The Oracle of Omaha, the world's third richest man who rarely leaves the United States, has come to town. He's making only his second trip to China ever. It's his first in more than a decade. And it's all because of this man, Eitan Wertheimer, the chairman of Iskar. That's the Israeli metalworking company that built this factory. He managed to convince Buffett to buy his company. About two years ago, um, Eitan sent me a letter. It was on October 15th, 2005. And uh, he talked about the situation uh, with his business and was looking for a partner. And uh, I was 10,000 miles away, and the letter was just a bit more than one page. But I could tell that this was something that was very, very interesting. It was a marvelous company, and it was run by marvelous people. The father and son team of Stefan and Eitan Wertheimer wanted to prepare their company for life long after their own leadership ended. They debated taking the company public, leverage buyouts, mergers, but no solution seemed right for their employees and their customers until they found Warren Buffett. And we were not in a hurry. It took us uh, three years to find that actually there's one different model than the rest of the world, and this is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway are very well known in the States. They're less known around Europe, around other parts of the world. And uh, for us, once we understood that that's the right solution, or it looks like the right solution, I wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter saying, what's the story and what we're looking for, and if he'd be interested to have coffee together. And uh, I got the answer a couple of hours after the letter reached him, uh, telling that sounds like an interesting, uh, very fascinating company, and if uh, by any chance we could come over to Omaha and have coffee. And I said, of course, we happen to be, <laughs> by the way, uh, we, we love to come. So you were just in town, you were just in the neighborhood and you stopped no. by? <laughs> we took our luggage and went to the airport. We were so happy to go and uh, talk to Warren. 
we didn't know what to expect. We were expecting a chain of secretaries in big buildings, but then we found a very modest man, very lovely, and uh, it clicked from the first minute. Omaha's a long way from wartimers' home in Israel, but if you want to borrow Buffett's ear, the surest and sometimes only way to do that is through Nebraska. In fact, uh, Piccolo's right here in South Omaha is Buffett's favorite place to bring out-of-towners for dinner. I love the food. The, 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 the two sisters are just terrific that run it, uh, but it, it just couldn't be a better place. So I'd, I'd take, you know, if A-Rod's in town or Jeff Immelt's coming into town tomorrow, we'll have dinner there, uh, whomever. Uh, and they always like it, and we always finish with a root beer float. Like many of Buffett's favorite things, Piccolo's is family-owned and operated. Prime rib is their specialty. It's available every night for $14.50. But co-owner Donna Sheehan says it's not always what the Oracle eats. When he comes in, what's he generally order? Because everybody hears about how uh, he likes french fries, he likes hamburgers. He will have either veal parm or chicken parm. Once in a while, he will have prime rib. And he has muscacholi and hash browns. He loves hash browns here. Lots of vegetables, too? Never orders any vegetables. <laughs> Not a big one, but he does <laughs> like the desserts, right? Yes, he loves rip beer floats. That's his thing That's every his time? Thing, every time, a big rip beer float. A dessert that all of his famous friends, from Bill Gates to Jeff Immelt to Alex Rodriguez, have come to enjoy, not to mention Wartimer and his crew, too. What did you think of Omaha? Looks like a big village. I didn't know how to read it. Uh, I'm not sure I yet understand Omaha, but it doesn't matter from where you come. I also come from a small village. Some other utilities on your radar screen right now. The deal to buy Wertheimer's company and, uh, was wrapped up in a matter of days. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway making a big acquisition. Buffett announcing the purchase on the eve of Berkshire's annual meeting in May of 2006. I love this company that we bought announced the purchase of yesterday. That, that, that's a, it's a significant business. It's a big business. Then you were able to, just a few months later, convince Warren to come to Israel. And that is not an easy thing to do, to get Warren Buffett to leave the country. Warren told me, I wrote to him earlier, why don't you come over? He said, listen, I haven't been to this country or that country or the ABCD. So don't expect me to uh, go around so quickly. And then he told me also that uh, he loves to sleep in his bed in Omaha. That's his most desired place for spending his time. I told Warren, listen, any lady going to the grocery store, every time she buys a tomato, she normally will touch the tomato to, to check the quality. Don't you want to come check? It's a big tomato over there. And he said, no, I'm, I'm doing the things my way and my system. So I told him, listen, promise me only one thing. If we finish the deal, will you come to Israel? He said, yes, I'm promising you. The second we finished the deal, he said, when do you want me to come? I said, September. So that's what happened. So what's it like to travel with Buffett, the man without an entourage? First of all, every time we travel with Warren, it's, it's, the kitchen gets very hot. A lot of people are curious about it. You've seen in Korea how we hardly could get him into the car and out of the car and a lot of other elements. A lot of people want to learn. A lot of people want to have a little signature on a book or to have a photograph for, for lifelong later to put on the fridge or some place in the room. You see that uh, people sit and understand that here is somebody with a great mind and a perfect balance between the heart, the pocket and the mind that hardly uh, you see it anywhere else, if at all. And it's uh, maybe the most rarest thing, and it's a blessing from God that they have a chance to listen and to see him alive. And uh, I feel the same every time I meet him. That admiration is mutual. They've done so much for me that, that uh, I, I, you know, I'm going to say yes to anything they ask me. <laughs> they, they've been, the, the Iskar people have been absolutely sensational. They, they fulfilled every expectation I had when we bought the company and then some in both human ways and in financial ways. So any, anything I can do to help, and I can't do much. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to bend metal or do anything of the sort, but um, anything I can do for them, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to do. They're wonderful people. Now you mentioned this was a two-day world tour. Why are your trips so short? Well, there, there's not much I can do uh, after, I can cut a ribbon, you know, I'm pretty good at that now, I've had a lot of practice, and I, and I can smile, and I, I can, uh, but in terms of t telling them how to lay out a factory, or telling them in terms of how to make sales calls, or develop new uh, ideas from r and I'm, I'm pretty useless, so, so I, I do what's, what I can do, and what's needed, and, and then I get back home.
you said you had real high expectations, especially about the South Korean plant before we got there. Um, meet your expectations, exceed, what'd you think? Well, what I saw in South Korea, and the new plant is just developing in China, and what I'd earlier seen in Israel, I have never seen it. In 77 years of life, I have never seen a better factory operation than the Iskart people uh, have put together in, in each of those places. They know as much about manufacturing as, as anybody I've ever seen. Up next, billionaire on board. We'll take you along for the ride with unprecedented access. And you never know who else might be on the plane. Also, is China really ready for a little green lizard and a family of cavemen? Why Warren Buffett hopes these familiar faces will mean billions in new business. And the surprising VIP who's got more than 275 million reasons for wanting to hang out with the Oracle of Omaha. As his plane sets off for Asia, Warren Buffett recalls his last visit to China 12 years ago. The first time we had that terrific time, uh, we went all over China. We spent 17 days there. There were seven couples, and we went Watch by me, plane, by train, by, by, by camel, by you name it, uh, all over China. And uh, uh, it was well planned. I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> and we went out all the way west. We came back on Mao's train, actually. and, and uh, uh, it was just uh, great people and a great time. This trip, though, is strictly business. On the ground in Asia for less than 20 hours, Buffett brings no assistant and no security along. Okay, Becky, go to it. But that doesn't mean his plane is empty. So oh. you bring an entourage when you come along because everybody, you've got a lot of different companies that are doing Yeah, they, they, they can do a lot of business there. We'll make the trip pay. Buffett's traveling because of Iskar, the only company Berkshire owns outside of the United States. But it's just one of over 70 companies in his portfolio. Buffett hopes that more of his managers will turn to Asia's high growth markets in the coming years. Great. It's a bargain. Irv Blumkin, CEO of the Nebraska Furniture Mart, joins the boss on this trip to China. Irv and I have been partners now for 24 years. In 1983, I, I bought the company on my birthday in, in 1983. And it's, you can't imagine a better association. We take vacations together vir virtually every year, and we have the time of our lives. The Nebraska Furniture Mart, 1983. In a deal sealed over a handshake with Irv's grandmother, Rose Blumkin, Buffett pays $60 million for the Omaha-based furnishing superstore. Today, that's equivalent to how much merchandise the Mart sells in a good month. And you've been going to China for how long? About 10 years. About 10 years for the business. What, that's right. And how much of your stuff comes from China right now? Probably 75, 80% comes from China today. And where did it used to be 10 years ago? Where was most of the furniture United coming States, from? United North States. North Carolina, mostly North Carolina. And what ha what's happened to the cost of furniture over the course of that time as you move from sourcing overseas? It's gone down dramatically and tremendous deflation in the category. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what, what great uh, value to the customer, though. Yeah, what, what kind of things are we looking for this trip out? This, this trip mostly case goods and some upholstery. Sofas, love seats, along with bedroom sets, dining room sets, occasional tables. After landing in Dalian, Blumkin leaves Buffett and spends 10 days traveling all over China and Vietnam. It's a tour he's quite familiar with, flying halfway around the world once a year to find the best bargains for Furniture Mart customers. Your family's been doing this for a long time. You've been doing this for a long time. Did the, the move to China for sourcing catch you by surprise? For sure, the drastic change in the fast pace of change uh, didn't catch us by surprise, but it moved a lot faster than we thought it would. And uh, it was a huge disruption in the furniture industry and in the channel distribution. Was it surprising? The, the fast pace of change was what was so surprising. What were you thinking, maybe two, three decades down the road? Yeah, I was thinking maybe uh, 20 years and, um, you know, it may be parts or it may be small things, but, you know, doing business when a, in a country so far away and uh, with lead time and c uh, customers wanting immediate gratification, I didn't see it quite as quick as it was gonna, It was really happening. What's it mean for prices, though? I mean, if you take a look at some of the prices that are here. Well, you know, you take a... You take a, a table like this. This table is a $429 table at the Furniture Mart price. Mm -hmm. It's lift top, it's wood, it's got all baskets. And in the United States, this would probably be 50% higher if it was produced really? in the United States. So it's $429 if this was made in the United States. I'm trying to do a little quick math, but it'd be something closer to $650? $650. Minimal. Minimal? Yes. 
While prices at the Furniture Mart are benefiting from low-cost manufacturing, Blumpkin says it's a trend that may not last forever. We're starting to feel some pressures. When I was over in China, you could see there was starting to be some labor shortages. Mm -hmm. The government wasn't subsidizing like they were before. They basically taken away uh, parts of the, the rebates they used to give these manufacturers. Um, the energy prices are going up. So you can start to see the pressure that's happening in China. That's why a lot of the Chinese factories are now moving to Vietnam, because they're going to the lower cost labor. Outsourcing to Asia was an easy decision for Blumpkin, and one that his boss, Warren Buffett, fully supports. When you first started talking to him about how you were going to be doing sourcing in more places, how you'd be going to China more often, was it something that he got immediately, or did he gradually over the years kind of pick up with it? He got it immediately. I mean, when we first said, you know, we have the opportunity to maybe do some business in China and lower our costs, give our customer better value, he understands that perfectly clear. And he's taught us so many things over the year, but the one thing that uh, he understands is if, if you're a low-cost producer and if you give the customer a good value, things will take care of themselves. Buffett does his part at the Mart as well. The store exclusively offers the Berkshire betting line. The deluxe model? The Warrens. My ambition in life was to be a mattress tester. I thought that would be a great job, just to sit there and test mattresses all day. Uh, so I told that to the Blumpkins, and when they came up with a special bed, they said, well, come out and test this one, and I pronounced it AAA. Do you have one? Uh, I think I've got one. I think I've got one. I, I, I can't tell you for sure. I mean, I told him to, I, I told Ostrid to get the mattress out there, and I'm sure she picked out the Warren, but I really, I, I've never actually, I don't know whether there's a label on it that says that or You've not. You've got to look under the sheets and check it that, out. That, yeah, right. That's what I've said. He goes, I bet Warren wouldn't know. I bet well, it, that's exactly right. <laughs> I can't tell you what color the carpet is in my bedroom or the walls. I mean, I just. Really? No. no. Why? I just don't see things like that. Because you're too busy thinking about other things. I don't things. know about that, but whatever it is, I don't really, I'm just not good at noticing things. Do you, do you know if, if, how much of your furniture comes from Nebraska Furniture Mart? Does... Oh, it all comes from It does. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it That's all comes from, yeah. There's okay. no question about that. <laughs> but furniture and metalworking aren't the only Berkshire operations in China. Buffett has high hopes for all of his businesses to eventually grab a piece of the Far East. In fact, someday, he'd like to see the Geico Gecko and the cavemen right along the Great Wall. What about uh, just in terms of Berkshire's operations? How big of a, of a market is China for stuff that you're selling into? Well, it, it isn't that big yet, but it'll, it, it, you know, it will get bigger by, by the year. Uh, Do you sell insurance there? We don't sell insurance there. You can only own 24.9% of an insurance right. company in China. We're looking into selling insurance there, though. Uh, 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 it, it depends on whether they open up ownership further as we go along. but. But it's it's a source of real interest. I've looked into it. In terms of having a Chinese partner, who uh, we might, uh, we probably have a Chinese partner. Mm -hmm. wow. But it would depend on if they would really open those rules and you could own more than twenty four point nine percent. Yeah, or it, I think it's likely to happen. But it but it. Uh, I don't know whether it's a year away or 10 years away. It would be auto insurance with us. And, it, would, it would be Geico. Yeah, we, we, we could save them money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, should be, they should be having petitions to let us in. <laughs> Still ahead, lessons of a lifetime, why they teach Warren Buffett in business school, and what you can learn by watching. Also, why Buffett is an MVP to one of baseball's biggest stars. a simple life in Omaha, but when Warren Buffett hits the road, life gets a little more complex. Crowds follow the Oracle everywhere he goes, from Washington, D.C. to Tefan, Israel. And from the time he steps off the plane in Dalian, China, to the time he boards in Daegu, South Korea, the cameras are rolling. Reporters from across Asia recording his every move on the ground. And everywhere, everyone wants to hear what Warren Buffett has to say especially when it comes to the markets. Markets tend to overshoot in both directions. And initially, people get excited in, stock, uh, in, in markets, and they advance because things are getting better and earnings are developing. My reaction is always to get more cautious because it's easy to get carried away in the stock market when things have been going very well. So I would, I, you should buy stocks because you think that they 
the businesses are worth more than you're paying. I don't try to predict stock markets. I try to find securities, uh, stocks that are selling for less than I feel that they're worth and buy them. As usual, just about every word he says in the interviews seems to hit the wires. Buffett says he's still negative on prospects for the U.S. dollar. And as always, Buffett doles out plenty of his characteristic advice on value investing. I am always looking for things I can understand. And if you understand the businesses and you buy at attractive prices, there really isn't much risk. Advice sought not only by Wall Street, Main Street, and investors around the world, but also by some high-flying superstars you might not expect. Well, I've always looked up to uh, Warren. He's just a fascinating personality. Uh, in my mind, the smartest man in the world. And, uh, you know, in the baseball world, he's like the Babe Ruth of baseball. And uh, he's just done it all. And to me, what's been most impressive about Warren is uh, how humble and uh, how he's been able to just keep his, uh, you know, his Omaha way about him. Yankee third baseman Alex Rodriguez. His interest in business and investing led him to seek out the Oracle's advice three years ago. I've read a lot of his books, and I just said, well, it was just fun to uh, call him up and, you know, see if he'll have a meeting with us. And uh, I went up to Omaha and had a great, you know, three- or four-hour meeting, and then we had a, a, a nice dinner in Omaha. And, uh, you know, ever since we've been friends, we keep in touch, and I follow everything he does, and it seems like he does the same with me. He has your jersey up on his wall. That's <laughs> one of the frame posters on his wall. What does that mean to you? It's not very often where you look up to someone like uh, Warren and, and then you can actually become friends with him, and, and in some cases uh, has been an advisor to my life and, and some of the business that I do off the field. And it's just, you know, it's really like a dream come true, because what comes out of, for me, out of Warren Buffett is not only is he a role model, but uh, his humility is the number one thing that... Uh, that I've enjoyed and, and try to do a little copycat and, and what he's been able to do. Rodriguez takes Buffett's advice to heart, not only on the field, but also in his other ventures, including a housing development company that he operates from Miami. We both have tremendous passion for what we do. I mean, I skip to the ballpark every day, and, and I've heard him say he skips to, the, to work every day. And uh, we both love baseball, that's for sure, and we both love business. And. Uh, He's much better at business than I'm at business, and I'm much better at baseball than he's at baseball. So uh, there's some differences, too. And he isn't the only athlete who's turned to Buffett. The Oracle is also friends with basketball star LeBron James, another hot name in sports, making $28 million a year. James sought out Buffett for investment advice, advice that Rodriguez says is twofold. Number one, he always likes these business and baseball analogies. Uh, he loved Ted Williams as a hitter. And he said one of the things that Ted did best was be a very patient hitter. And he says, it's the same thing you have to do in business. Be very patient. Don't swing at a lot of pitches. But when you get your pitch, try to smack it out of the park. <laughs> and that's kind of his philosophy in business. And for me, the, the best thing he told me was, don't forget about what you do best and thus play baseball. Go out and try to be the best and greatest baseball player uh, you can be for the longest time. And that's the best thing you can do for your business, for your family, and for your legacy. And I thought that was great. But you don't have to be a sports hero to gain access to Buffett's ear in his hometown. You just have to own a share or two of Berkshire stock. Of course, that'll run you over $100,000. Loyal Buffett followers descend on Omaha every year. If you knew Warren like I know Warren, oh, 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 what a guy. Dubbed Woodstock for capitalists, Buffett's annual meeting is part carnival. <laughs> There's something <laughs> symbolic about me being out of bold. <laughs> part concert. Testing one million, two million, three million, yeah, right, okay. And all education. I think I learned more here than I do in school for a whole semester, maybe a whole year. The advice that I picked up is go out and read as many books on investing as you can. Did someone say books? Take your pick. No fewer than 40 have been written about Buffett and his investing style. A number of the best are used in a one-of-a-kind course devoted to investing the Buffett way at the University of Missouri-Columbia's True Last Business School. In this class, we've talked about how much cash Buffett currently has and on Berkshire Hathaway's balance sheet. Harvey Eisen, chairman of Bedford Oak Partners, is a Berkshire shareholder and a Mizzou alum. He brought the idea to the university's dean, Bruce Walker. Harvey Eisen said, so given how successful Mr. Buffett is, why don't you teach your students more about what he does? We had discussions. I brought it up with the faculty. 
Mr. Eisen agreed to underwrite the course, and it's been very successful ever since we first offered it. So successful that the course, now in its ninth year, is filled to capacity every semester and currently has a waiting list. Andy Kern was a student in the course and now teaches it. This is an alternative uh, perspective on business. It's that appreciation for all things that make up a company, not just the financials. Warren Buffett has been the best at allowing you to understand everything that makes up a good business. While the principles in the course remain the same year after year. He looks for a company that is undervalued, has a competitive advantage for the future, and has management that is going to make rational decisions and do what's best for the company. The content changes as students grasp the global nature of Buffett's latest moves. Right now there are still big fish in other countries that I think he's starting to intern, starting to discover. To achieve those desired returns, he has to go outside the U.S. Uh, borders to find some of those undervalued companies. Eisen, who checked with Buffett before pitching the course, still fully funds it out of his own pocket. Each year, he accompanies about 40 students to Omaha, where they get to spend time with the man himself. They can't wait. Kids have told me it is the highlight of their lives. Forget college careers. They are so turned on. They are so excited just to be able to do that. The Mizzou program is just one of many student groups that travel to Omaha each year for a tour of Berkshire operations and a no-holds-barred question-and-answer session with the Oracle. We usually start out uh, going to Nebraska Furniture Mart, and then we go from there to his office. He answers questions for about an hour and a half, and we, uh, we go to Gratz. We sit down, and we all have open-faced roast beef sandwiches and mashed potatoes, cherry cook. A menu selected and approved by Buffett himself. When we come back, the ultimate in business class. You think flying commercial is tough? Even Warren Buffett has to deal with the frustrations of getting from here to there. We'll give you an unprecedented and surprising look at what it takes to get the world's third richest man halfway around the world and back. Plus, wait till you see what's in his wallet. Warren Buffett, the billionaire investor, enjoys a quiet moment on his private jet as he heads towards Asia. He's savoring it, and he better because it's the last quiet moment he'll have over the next 30 hours or so. the type of greeting your average business traveler might expect when arriving in Asia. But then again, Buffett's not your average business traveler. In China, local dignitaries, military escorts, and media outlets are all waiting on the tarmac. You'd think a reception like that would be hard to top. That is, until you arrive in Daegu, South Korea, where the mayor personally escorts him through customs, and a marching band does its best to try and make Buffett feel at home. this while throngs of reporters do their best to make him feel wanted. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. He's lucky to escape in one piece. While he doesn't speak Chinese or Korean, Buffett is more than able to get by. Translators help, but so does Buffett's ease with people and a heavy dose of horsing around. When I arrived at the airport, uh, your wonderful mayor uh, started showing me the city and he told me that it was known as the uh, City of beautiful women, and I must say, he's a very good reporter. <laughs> On a trip like this, Buffett lets his guard down. Maybe it's the casual wardrobe, maybe it's the lack of sleep. He doesn't get any for the first 28 hours or so. But if you ever wondered what the billionaire next door keeps in his wallet, well, now's the time to ask. I won't show you everything. I guess I've got about maybe $600 in here. Here's a $50 bill from a bank we owned in Rockford, Illinois, and if you look at it, down at the bottom, it's signed by the fellow who ran the bank for me. He, they issued their own currency, so I carry that around for good luck. <laughs> and uh, here we have my McDonald's card, which lets me eat free at any McDonald's in Omaha for the rest of my life. So that's why the Buffett family has Christmas dinner at McDonald's. That explains a lot of things. <laughs> Does anybody else have one of those cards? Uh, there's just a few of them. Bill Gates has one. 
his is good throughout the world, I guess. And mine is only good in Omaha, but I never leave Omaha, so mine's just as good as his is. <laughs> Who doesn't have one? Pardon me? Who doesn't have one? Well, uh, I, I, I think, I think uh, President Clinton wanted one very badly, but I don't think he has one. I think he has to go to McDonald's with me. <laughs> Here's one from Johnny Rockets, which is a, a place I like very much. I like the milkshakes there, and the, uh, I like the music there. And this lets me take uh, the three guests with me, actually. Uh, uh, so, so play up to me, and maybe someday you'll get to go to Johnny Rockets with me. And let's see what else we have. Got a few credit cards. There. Got pictures of my uh, grandchildren when they were younger. They're my children when they were young, and uh, I keep those with me. And really, there's not a whole lot more here. There's a driver's license and. As you can see, the billfold is about 30 years old. It, it's only been out a few times during that period. I, it, 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 often laws come out when I pull out my billfold. Eitan Wertheimer, the head of the Israeli metalworking company that Buffett bought in 2006, planned this trip. He's calling me my travel agent, international travel agent. Wertheimer's packed the itinerary to give Buffett a taste of the local culture every step of the way. Sometimes it's a tad more of a taste than Buffett would like. Take the 12-course meals of the local cuisine. It's a little rich for a man who's used to eating a very limited diet, mostly cherry cokes, burgers, and french fries. 77 years old and I haven't heard of this. Six courses into lunch with the mayor of Dalian, Buffett finally gets the meal he's been waiting for. Of course, back on the plane, it's a different story. Here, he can do things his way from the get-go. We've got a lot of candy. They, they treat me like any other five-year-old on this trip, yeah. Five-year-old, meaning you get any kind of food you want? Pretty much, yeah. yeah I, Is there Dairy Queen in the back? Well, there, there, sometimes there are uh, uh, dilly bars or something. But <laughs> they probably didn't get them this morning. And it's not just dilly bars. The one constant on this trip, cans of cherry Coca-Cola. Buffett calls it his health food. Oh, I manage my health. I drink lots of Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> we... We own about 8% of Coca-Cola, so we get the profit on one out of every 12. So I recommend that all of you drink Coca-Cola, and you too will live to be 77. <laughs> and when he says lots, he means it. I drank uh, five 12-ounce cans uh, a day before we bought the stock, and I bought, I, I drink five 12-ounce cans a day after we bought the stock. So I, uh, I like the product. Uh, and no matter how much I like the product, I would not have bought the stock unless I thought it was very attractive for its long-term prospects. Traveling around Asia certainly is easier when you go with a billionaire. But even being Warren Buffett isn't enough to cut through every bit of red tape. Yeah, that's uh, just moments before we realized Buffett's luggage was missing. Buffett is ever the gentleman, and he didn't stress over this issue. And that bag, just in case you were wondering, yes, it was recovered. Warren Buffett, the billionaire next door going global. For all of us at CNBC, thanks for watching. I would say goodbye in Chinese, but I don't like to show off. <laughs> <laughs> These are applications from the serious candidates for the new CIO of Berkshire Hathaway. There are already four potential candidates. He just brought a little light reading for the plane. Yeah, a little light reading. <laughs> a little light reading. <laughs> It's just like Superman going into a phone booth, right? <laughs> I learn a lot by, by reading. Uh, I, every, and I learn a lot by talking to smart people. Uh, and I listen to what they say. And it's not very complicated. Uh, you should finish the day a little smarter than you started the day. Uh, if you don't, you're making a mistake. Uh, I should miss, uh, mention I also listen to CNBC. <laughs> <laughs> Hi,